The inbox goes on and on and on, scrolling its way from newbies to pros. Where does it stop? Nobody knows. Six months ago, I skimmed this vertical pile of publicity for truly hidden gems, rounding up a list of games I picked based on me not having heard of them whatsoever. If I saw any previews, reviews, interviews, news reports, scandals, or forum posts, it didn't count. And now I'm ready for round two, which was a whole lot easier this time, thanks to some frenetic imports and indies who were more than ready to fight for the spotlight. Some of them didn't make the cut, but I think I found at least four good games here. Games that I've only seen in my inbox. First up, we have Copy Kitty, a manic side-scrolling shoot-'em-up that channels treasure games by way of a bullet hell. The Copy Kitty fires and moves a bit slower than usual for your main character in this kind of game, but that's to temper the pacing for humongous, fast, screen-filling explosions that conclude almost every other kill. It's delayed gratification. Enemy bullet patterns are slow enough for you to zigzag in and out of them, and your own bullets and character move slow enough that you need to mentally prepare for your own moves. And then bam, everything lights up. There's lots of room for damage-multiplying combos, thanks to hoppable heads and a defensive kick that is easily turned offensive with the application of gravity and the down button. There's a high skill ceiling, a pretty light show, an infectious soundtrack, and a lot of different ways to shoot things that explode into all the pretty colors, including a melee weapon that gives you a Hadouken. Copy Kitty's titular copying ability is basically an excuse to litter the ground with tons of weapon pickups, and once you have two, you unlock a third firing option that combines those two, ultimately resulting in uh, uh, th this many different ways to blow things up into a totally gratuitous but readable splash of color. Sifting through a whole lot of Japanese anime girl bullshit has to happen here, and that's actually pretty easy to do. These games tend to be better than they look. Mana Collect has made the Kamiket circuit for the past couple years, but it's only now made its way stateside by way of Fruit Bat Factory. And what Mana Collect is, is a real-time competitive action spin on Minesweeper. You walk across a 2D hex grid, uncovering seven tiles at a time of numbers, with those numbers referencing how many sweet spots you need to find in adjacent tiles. You don't want to avoid the mines here, you want to dig them out of the pile and mark them, which schedules a deposit of points to your scoring bank if you can manage to find them all within a certain time limit. Mark a spot incorrectly though and you're immobilized for a couple seconds. Keeping track of timed penalties wouldn't sound like a penalty unless this was some kind of competition. On top of giving your opponent more time to move around if you mess up, you also have a multiplier timer to juggle that has the both of you racing against each other to uncover the secrets underneath these boards, with all of these incoming points being cashed out for attacks that gradually whittle away meters until someone's declared a loser. It's a complicated game, a juggling of genres that doesn't just put a new twist on Minesweeper, it portals it to a new plane of space and time. It forces you to both think and act at a really fast pace, juggling strategic risks and rewards while also keeping track of a deductive logic puzzle. The weirdest thing of all is that it works. It's an exhilarating and exhausting competition, and there's local multiplayer too, if your friends don't get weirded out. They're not much to look at, but I have a huge amount of respect for the telepath games. For much of the past decade, a guy named Craig Stern has been cultivating an epic RPG franchise pretty much by himself. And you can kinda tell. The reason why you've probably never heard of these games before is because he, frankly, could use much, much more of an art budget. This time, these sprites might have looked decent if the camera wasn't so far zoomed out. At this elevation, we can see way more repetitive tiling than the skillful pixeling put into these sprites. The sad reality of the market is that consumers will judge by the cover, even though beauty is only skin deep. Because the looks of this game do not stimmy its massive tide of ambition and skill that were well applied. Telepath Tactics is basically a full-sized Fire Emblem or Shining Force, but born and raised on the PC amateur game dev scene by a guy who knows way more about strategy game design than any amateur. Permanent party deaths and the high stakes of turn-by-turn -turn tension mean that every decision carries high consequences. 
It requires you to really hunker down and think, to lure enemies into traps and ambush them from flanks and always be guessing what they're going to try two turns ahead of time. That's because of a design philosophy that Craig Stern calls skill-based determinism, where luck and randomness are downplayed in favor of high percentage rolls and hard hits. The game, as a result, plays closer to a tabletop game than a video game, without a lot of low-level mooks you can just effortlessly slap away or unbalanced battles that are there just for grinding experience. As a result, losing is fun, and retrying battles over and over again for better results is hopelessly engrossing. That's why it's not just a lo-fi homage. There are a couple factors here that make it feel like a worthy evolution of the Japanese tactical RPGs it was based on. Like how you can push and shove enemies into hazard tiles, which adds a whole new element of strategic depth when you have to move your units around precarious edges. It's just a shame that it looks like this. Punch Club was formerly known as VHS Story. Maybe they changed the name to avoid the trademarks of other games that have VHS and Story in the title. In either cases, you have some truly excellent pixel artwork setting the stage for a nostalgic puzzle. In this game's case, we have a Life Sam, a time and money manager, in which you train a buff stubby shirtless fighter to the top of the big leagues to avenge your father's horrifying death. Drop down and give me 20, clock in and out of work, hit the gym, reference movies, and track your gains in what is basically a video game version of an 80s training montage, with the player organizing our fighters' time and activities for maximum efficiency. The mouse-only, click-and-wait interface reveals the game's mobile intentions. It is scheduled for cell phones as well as PCs, but thankfully there doesn't seem to be a lot of room for microtransactions here. Waiting never lasts longer than a few seconds, to keep with the shot-by-shot -shot movie montage pace, and it doesn't take long to earn enough money and experience to chip away at an impressive tree of upgrades and story events. However, there's a ruthless muscle loss curve that requires you to stay at the top of your management game all the time, constantly staying in shape, or else our bronzed beefcake loses his edge faster than he can gain it. Combat is handled in a dice-rolling RPG style, where you basically swap bonuses in and out every few seconds between watching these fighters roll dice at one another. The basic loop going on here is the same one you might have enjoyed before in Game Dev Story. It's a solid and addicting pace for mobiles, and good for a single day or two of strangely lengthy sessions on PC. But the game's change of title, its rough translation, and their strange decision to pull out of early access during development might have had something to do with why I've only ever seen this one inside of my inbox.